Hi, everyone. Welcome to our third annual Postcards uh, panel session. We're very glad to have six superstars that uh, have successfully managed to, to neurosurgery this year and are gladly joined us uh, for this session. Uh, this is the first time we're also recording this session, the first portion of it, uh, so that uh, people can benefit from this later on. Uh, we will be having a general about one hour group chat discussion with the residents. And you can ask all your questions and then maybe we can assign a breakout room groups of two so that uh, you can have a more intimate sort of experience. Uh, I'll also pass it uh, to Abrar, one of uh, the members of the counseling team to introduce some of the new members you've recruited as part of the, uh, the group. Thanks, Saman. Can everyone hear me? Terrific. Hi, everyone. My name is Abrar, and as Saman mentioned, I'm part of CAMSign. And before we begin with this great talk, I want to take a moment to just introduce some of our new members, and I'll let them uh, tell you all what their position on CAMSign is as I read out their names. So just to begin, Sanjana, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sanjana Zavaria, and um, I'm uh, I just finished my first year at UBC, and I'm on CAMSign just to help with some educational activities. Very Thank excited. You. Sina, would you like to introduce yourself next? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sina Zamiri. I'm uh, the graphic designer for CAMSign, so I help with the, uh, designing the posters and everything. And I'm in my fourth year of undergrad at University of Toronto. Thank you. Rataj, would you like to introduce yourself next? Hi, everyone. I'm Rataj. I just finished my second year at Western. I'm also uh, helping out with Sanjana in terms of the educational programming side of things as well. Thank you. And Crystal, would you like to introduce yourself next? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Crystal. I'm a third year student at UBC. And as part of CAMSAN, I'm helping out with internal communications. And just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists for being here today. And last but not least, Farbad, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. So my name is Farbad Niazi. I just finished the uh, first year of med, med school at U of, U of Montreal. And I'm the social media manager. So I post all of uh, Sina's beautiful designs online. So you can all see them. Okay, awesome. I think that covers everyone. So maybe we can also get an introduction or great panelists. I'll just try to read in the order that I see on the screen, uh, Mohamed. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, uh, so it's actually the, this is a different feeling for me because I used to be on the other side as a, as one of the host of the Cam Science events, and this is the first time I'm the guest here. So thank you for inviting me. And uh, as you can see from my name tag, I, I was matched to University of Ottawa Neurosurgery Program this year. Um, I'm I'm happy to be uh, to answering all the questions you have about how to choose your neurosurgery as your future career, and also how to. Uh, be ready to apply for the neurosurgery in your program. Excellent. Uh, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Jennifer Lashinsky. Um, I graduated um, medical school from University of Manitoba, and I am one of the two University of Manitoba neurosurgery matches this year. Um, I look forward to answering any questions that you guys have or uh, swaying you as to why University of Manitoba is a great program. Excellent. Andrea? Hi, thanks for having me also. My name is Andrea. I just graduated from Western Med School and I matched to U of T uh, for residency. So yeah, any questions feel free to ask and hopefully you'll find what I have to share helpful. Also congrats on two milestones uh, personally. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just got married too and I'm in Norway currently, so. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Christopher. Hey, everyone. I'm Chris. Uh, I did med school at the University of Ottawa, and I matched to the University of Toronto. So happy to be here and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Jack? Hey, everyone. I'm Jack. Uh, I did my med school in Toronto, and uh, I'm about to start my residency at the University of Saskatchewan. Excellent. And Irene? Yeah. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming. Uh, I also did uh, my uh, med school at uh, Toronto and uh, matched to Edmonton. So we're looking forward to going out west. Wonderful. So I think what we can do is just to have a very liberal approach. So if you have questions, uh, we can just directly unmute. It would also be nice if you can turn your cameras on just so that we can see you and the panelists can see you. So 
That's uh, our small little request and you can get started. Any question? We already have prepared questions too, but we prefer to, to have you ask the question. So if you'd like to unmute and get started, feel free to. Okay, maybe I'll start with the, with the list of questions we already have. Uh, one of the things that I think people are very interested in is going through the process of the CARMS and coming out of it. What would be two main takeaways that you would say you wish you knew or could have benefited from earlier if we could have this from all our panelists? Or one. Um, I guess I can begin. I think something that surprised me a lot going through the CARMS tour was that every school is very different in the types of questions that they'll ask you and the format of the questions, but I was also very surprised at how informal some of the question periods were and how sometimes it was much of, here's 15 minutes, tell us what we need to know about you, tell us what would make you a good resident, and being prepared to not only Fill that time, but also ask questions and begin a conversation that's it's difficult over Zoom, of course, having a two way conversation, but trying to facilitate that was something that it came easier after the first couple times it happens, but just being prepared for some of that informality and some of the just basic human discussions that you're going to have instead of prepared um, answers that you're going to recite was something that surprised me, but I also enjoyed. I think uh, for those of you who are in uh, clerkship or earlier on in medical school, uh, definitely logging kind of uh, important patient interactions has always been helpful. So a lot of the questions were, you know, focused on, you know, tell me about a patient mistake or perhaps a conflict with a supervisor, or conflict with a patient or, you know, a colleague. Um, so there was, um, you know, not only kind of like the positive encounters of, you know, when you were a leader or, you know, when you advocated for a patient, but I found time and time again, kind of in each interview, there was uh, some sort of negative connotation as well. So whether it be conflict or um, obviously your weaknesses or a time you didn't do as well or a time you failed, um, you know, so uh, keeping track of um, all experiences, both positive and negative. I just want to echo what Irene uh, mentioned that it's, it's very important to start thinking about um, the special cases that you had during the clerkship in the fourth year, because when they ask you those questions in interview, so it's very hard to come up with the answer right away. Maybe in half an hour, you find an excellent example of the question you asked, but uh, if you prefer that for, in advance, would you, it would be very beneficial, especially, for example, you can think about all can meds and try to find, for example, one good example of the can med and what bad, bad example of the can med in all cases you've seen. For example, if it's a teamwork, where was the, uh, what was the one special case that the teamwork failed? What was the one special case when the teamwork went very well? So we have a communication was very helpful. And I think that prepares, uh, prepares you for interview a lot. And then uh, that also reduces your stress because you're, you're prepared for, more, for many questions they ask in the in interviews. I guess I can go next. Um, I kind of have two tips. So one more applies to the interviews. Um, since interviews are most likely going to be kept virtual, I think some helpful tips for that are to practice talking to your camera and not your screen because it can make it definitely more personal that you're talking to someone instead of just staring off into your screen as well as investing in a ring light. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it can really enhance the quality of your video. And then um, another tip kind of along with the CARMS, more so the application though, is something I wish I did. Um, so long story short, two of my, um, two of the people who were writing me letters, they submitted it on the last day that they possibly could, which was immensely stressful. And I did have colleagues who gave fake deadlines to the people who wrote their letters. So I don't know how ethical that is, but it worked for them and it alleviated a lot of stress. So it's kind of something that I wish I did as well, kind of gave them a tentative date just so that there was that 
extra bit of buffer room so I didn't have to stress out as much, but that's kind of a hindsight's 2020. So those are my tips. I think I can jump in. Um, it seems like we're talking about interviews. So I'll give my tips about interviews, which is, you know, try to practice, try to have some kind of structure, but try not to sound over rehearsed. I think after doing so many interviews, I know they ask different questions, but you'll get the same like 10, 15 questions. So try to have a different kind of change to each question because they will all ask you why neurosurgery, uh, what kind of mistakes you've made and whatnot. So uh, try not to sound like a robot after you've said it like three or four times at different schools. Um, yeah, that'd be my tip. I guess um, I'll jump in. Um, I think in hindsight now, I would say one takeaway I took from the entire process that was a very, very long three weeks. <laughs> a lot of back-to-back -back interviews um, and they're pretty much spread out. Like sometimes it's it's one day after the year. Sometimes there's like maybe two, three days in between. Uh, so just in that entire process, figuring out you know, your way to, to de-stress, to stay well, to get rested before your big days. I think that's something that's uh, super important and something to keep in mind going forward. So for those of you, I think that covered all of our panelists, correct? All six of you. Yes, excellent. So we prefer if you ask the questions, we do have a list. So if any of you would like to, perfect, there we go, exit Linda. Hey everyone! Thanks so much for uh, for joining for being here today. It's uh, it's really helpful for us um, to hear from your experiences. I was just wondering um, for all of you who've gone through visiting electives and and even just clerkship in general, um, what do you think are the most important skills to kind of have down pat for your visiting electives, and how did you go about acquiring those skills? And they could be either kind of uh, hands on, like you know, uh, cl clerical skills or even soft skills. Yeah, so just to jump in and clarify, we actually, uh, our cohort actually didn't have any visiting electives. Uh, so that will be, I guess, new for um, uh, the coming year this year. Um, so I think it was uh, tough for us to obviously uh, network outside of the programs, but I think this was reiterated kind of through the entire CARMS applications that, um, uh, you know, that obviously those connections with other programs are lacking, but uh, you can always reach out to others and be part of like uh, the virtual camp sign uh, program, programming uh, to network kind of beyond the visiting electives. But I think as for, um, you know, any elective, it's important to just um, obviously be a part of the team, contribute, you know, as much as possible where you can obviously be very uh, eager, enthusiastic, kind of, um, you know, when dealing with your patients and in the group and uh, giving back to the team as a whole. And your interactions uh, go beyond just that of the residents and the staff. It's also how do you deal with, you know, the social workers or the nursing or, you know, um, patients themselves, the caregivers. Um, so there's, I think, feedback coming uh, from all avenues. I can go next. Um, so regarding the question, uh, how, what's the best thing to do, you know, during the electives or during the, uh, the clerkship, I would say that based on my understanding, I think, of course, it's different from the school to school. Maybe the different surgeons have different expectations from the students. But um, from my own experience, um, at the third year level or the fourth year level, they don't expect you to know, for example, all different approaches to the neurosurgery, you know, what's the best way to just uh, do this specific operation. They just want you to know, have general knowledge about neurosurgery, for example, the, the most common type of the tumors, or very, very general information, and also know how to how to basically uh, take care of the patient in the ward. I think that's what they expect you to know more. And um, the other thing, which is very important, as Iron mentioned, it's very important to be a, a perfect team member. So it means that you have to be there on time, always be there, be present, and then you have to, they have to be loyal, uh, reliable. So if, they, if you uh, um, assign some responsibility to you, you have to make sure you just meet that, that, that uh, responsibility before doing something else. For example, uh, many of us are so eager about neurosurgery that we like to, we want to just jump into the OR right away. But you have to first finish, for example, seeing a patient in the ward before um, doing something extra, which is basically beyond the expectation of you. 
And uh, the other thing is that be enthusiastic. So ask questions, uh, read around the cases. They always say that. And um, if, if you don't know the answer of the question, that's totally fine, as long as you show passion about it. If they ask you a question one day and you don't know the answer, you can just go, go home and read about it. But if the next time they ask the same question and you cannot answer that, that's a big problem. So I think because it shows that maybe you're not passionate enough to learn. So I think keep, keep yourself passionate, enthusiastic about it, and also be present, be a great team member. I can jump in. Honestly, I feel like I'm, I'm going to be saying the same thing um, that everyone else already said. But um, I noticed that, you know, they don't expect you to have this crazy level of knowledge. And if you have it, it's great. But honestly, they just expect you to be hardworking, uh, compassionate, caring, and most importantly, a good team player. Uh, my experience was that you interact with the residents more than the staff. So just kind of anything you do to make the residents' lives easier, uh, you know, whether that's helping them with consoles, helping them with the floor, um, things like that go a long way. And I would say if you are given responsibility, um, you know, if you're on call or whatever, just being very, um, like very cautious and doing the right thing. If you don't know something, don't be a cowboy, um, ask for help when needed. And, uh, and I think those little things go a long way and the residents see that. And then that gets kind of passed down to staff. And I think that makes asking for letters down the road easier. I can go next, kind of echoing, <clears throat> excuse me, off of Chris and just saying that, yeah, if you don't know something, um, understand that you don't know it and don't be afraid to ask questions. But like you said, always um, being like reliable in a sense. So if a resident, you know, obviously when you're second year, maybe the beginning of third year, you're not as comfortable with your physical exams and interpreting those types of things. But um, when you get into your fourth year and you're doing electives, ensuring that when you go and examine a patient, you take a history, you're getting you're going to get the same history or very, very close to the history that the resident would get or the same exam that the resident would get showing that it's reproducible, that you're reliable, you're not skipping steps and you're able to actually get a meaningful neuro exam and write a meaningful consult. I think that that honestly goes a really long way. And like Chris said, when you're doing that and you're showing the residents that they don't have to redo every aspect of the neuro exam because they can trust yours, that gets passed on to attendings to show that you're gaining independence and you're able to function um, independently as a med student, and then hopefully that'll translate into a, an early resident. I agree with what everyone's saying, you know, like being a team player, showing up early, staying late, trying to help out, doing a good consult. Those are all things that apply throughout clerkship and whether or not you want to do neurosurgery. Um, I think one thing that a lot of people worry about is technical skills. And I have to say that clerkship at least for me, it was a great time to learn. And whether you get to scrub into the OR or not, you can buy like suture kits on Amazon. You can ask your anatomy teacher if you can practice in the cadaver lab because ours at my med school let us do that. So I think it's really good if you have the building blocks. So when you go into the OR, it's not new for you. So it's like, you know how to suture already, you know how to not tie so that when you're with the residents or the fellows, they can actually teach you skills beyond that. And I think that's really crucial because it shows that you're interested. Yeah, you're not an expert, obviously. You're a med student, you're learning. And I think it just shows great initiative that you're like, yes, I want to be a surgeon. Look at these skills that I've gained so far. And it just allows you to build from there. So again, not crucial by any means, but I think it's something just being in a surgical specialty applies. I think something... Um... <clears throat> To keep in mind, especially as you, know, you guys are allowed to do visiting electives again, is to be flexible because um, chances are you're going to spend like one week or two weeks at each school or each hospital. And just because you've settled into your role at one place and know your tasks and know your role on the team doesn't mean that you're going to be, you're going to have the same role or be asked to do the same task there. So always just, you know, don't be um, kind of in a way stubborn as to, oh, like, this is what I know how to do. I'm going to apply the same skills to the next one. Like, try to be flexible, see what the team needs, see what the residents need, um, and, and go from there. Okay, thanks so much, Ivo. Don't be shy ask questions. Okay, I guess uh, I'll 
ask another one. Uh, when did you know exactly that he wanted to go to neurosurgery? At what time point? And what did you actively do during that period? Sure, I can answer this one first. Um, when did I actually know that I wanted to do neurosurgery? Um, probably in third year after I, I actually did a proper rotation in it. I think you have interest in it and you you're kind of think it's interesting and it's cool. And, but until you actually do it, that's kind of when you're like, okay, I can see myself doing this. So it was in third year during my, my core surgery rotation where I got to spend like about a week or so with the, the team. Um, and I just found that it was kind of the people that I enjoyed working with the most. Um, it was the rotation I really enjoyed. Um, and I think that's when I was like, okay, like I, I'm not scared to commit to this. And I think that's, that's when. Can go next. So uh, I was thinking about neurosurgery from maybe um, uh, towards the end of the first year, but uh, similar to Chris, so I just want to have a, a really like a, um, educated decision. I just want to make sure that this is the right choice for me. That's why in, in the clerkship, I try to focus on medicine versus surgery. I just want to make sure that I, I would be happier in the OR. And that's what exactly the feeling I had. And then uh, I tried to get a, so I had like a, a vascular surgery, general surgery, neurosurgery in the third year. And then um, in the fourth year, I had a chance to like be, be in OR for different, um, for different disciplines uh, more often. And then, uh, so then like I confirmed my decision on the, on the fourth year because I said, I, I, like, I like every single pathology I see in neurosurgery. I like every single operation and I can see myself doing those for the rest of my life. But for example, for vascular surgery, it was not like this. So I like some of the operations, but not every, not, I didn't like the amputations, for example. So I think that was the, that was the time that I, I just, um, I knew that I, I just wanted to become a neurosurgeon for the rest of my life. And how do I prepare myself? So I think few things are very important in neurosurgery, as you all know. Um, first of all, having the being a good clerk, I think that's the most important thing that the, the, the schools uh, emphasize on. But it's also good to have um, some research experience because, as you know, neurosurgery is very heavy in research. You want to show that you have a passion about research. You have some basic skills about, of doing your research. That's very important to show to the schools. And the other thing is that uh, connection is very important. I think it's good to start making connection with other people. Um, camp sign, uh, it's, it's a very good opportunity to just make those connections. Personally, I, I'm uh, despite not, not being able to do electives in other provinces, um, through camp sign, we just make connections to almost every, to every school, to every, uh, uh, the residents from every single school. I think these are the, uh, the biggest things I, I, can, I can pass to you, just make connections, do some research experience, and be a great, great clerk. Um, I can go next to um, just to echo all of um, Mohammed's points about research and whatnot before I go into, you know, kind of my story, um, just saying like any type of research. Also, like there's some people here who have excellent and amazing um, neurosurgical research, also um, research in neurosciences, et cetera. I have no research in neurosciences. Um, I have uh, we have a BSc med program here in Manitoba. I did mine in HIV research looking for novel vaccine targets. I all my research was in things unrelated to neurosurgery, but I think that that doesn't necessarily mean that you're out for the count. I looked at these people when I started, when I saw my CARMS cohort and I was like, I am screwed because I was like, I don't have any, all these people have PhDs in something that's related to neurosurgery and neuroscience. And I didn't have any research in the area. It doesn't necessarily matter. Um, showing that you're capable of producing quality data and writing papers and contributing to research is something that's very important and it doesn't necessarily matter that it's not in neurosurgery. So that's something that I wanna get across early. Um, I definitely don't think I knew that I wanted to do neurosurgery until kind of like Chris said, like maybe my core rotation in third year. And I didn't, don't think I thought I could do it until fourth year when I started my electives. I spent eight weeks with the neurosurgeons and the residents. And, you know, the first time you do something successfully, a big procedure nearly independently, I think you kind of just get some reassurance and then you'll be smacked down again when 
you don't know something or something uh, you missed something that was pretty obvious and the residents are like hey wake up <laughs> but um, you'll definitely have those experiences and uh, the ups and downs as you go through it you'll think can I do this I want to do this but um, I think like Mohammed also said deciding on is this what you want to do do you want to be in the OR all the time putting that time in I did the same thing as him. I went through, I think in, in med two it was COVID at the time. So I went through like every surgical subspecialty I could because the only time I could get out of the house was to shadow. So I went through everything and I didn't find anything that I thought this is so interesting that I would want to dedicate my life to researching it, to waking up in the middle of the night to deal with this pathology, except for neurosurgery. So I think that that's where the, it kind of consolidated the fact that I wanted to do this. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Jennifer. My name is Shivani. I don't think I've introduced myself, but I'm a first year medical student. Um, I just have a question, like how much research are we expected to do? Like, in is there an expectation on like, oh, you should have like at least five papers published or something like that? Or is this just like a basic recommendation or is to, like, do some research, you know? I think in uh, general, it's hard to quantify, like Jennifer was saying, um, you know, uh, research uh, amongst uh, our cohort uh, varied quite a bit, anywhere from uh, people doing master's or PhDs in the neurosurgical specialty versus, uh, uh, you know, doing other research, uh, perhaps not associated with neuroscience. So it's hard to quantify that, you know, when and I don't think they're necessarily looking, you know, for nature papers versus a specific count of other papers. It's, I think, a lot more so uh, the how you convey your interests and how you pursue kind of the passion and how dedicated you are to the field. Obviously, it's a long journey, you know, after uh, medical school and then another uh, six years minimum. So uh, they're just really looking for that passion and how you work with people. Makes sense. Thank you. I can ask a question if that's all right. So um, my question is regarding the medical schools that may not have a neurosurgical program or a neurosurgical residency program. Do you have any tips on how to, I guess, build your portfolio for CARMS or build those connections despite not having a neurosurgical program at your home institution? I don't know if I'm the most qualified person <laughs> to say this, but I can kind of relate because I went to the Windsor campus at Western. So we do have neurosurgeons in Windsor. There's about five of them, but it's not necessarily like I'm at the home school where I know the program director and I know like that group of people. And I work with residents because in Windsor, we barely have any surgery residents and you may not have any on your rotation. So with that kind of background in mind, I guess some tips that I have are Firstly, if I know this may be different if you don't have it at your own home school, but what I did was I tried to get as many opportunities at London that I could. So now that traveling electives are available, I'm sure if you email other schools, maybe if you have your top three or top four schools that are in, you're interested in, just email them and say, hey, can I do a shadowing opportunity with you or like try to arrange like a couple weeks in the summer? I think that could be super helpful because not only do you get exposure to realize if neurosurgery is for you, you also get to meet people, meet the residents, learn about neurosurgery and kind of just get that exposure. So I think that's a big tip. Um, a second tip I had to kind of along the same lines is it's never too early to show your interest in a program. Like for instance, I knew U of T was one of my top choices since like second year of med school so I reached out fairly early they had a brain school program that you could attend they invited me to attend that virtually luckily COVID helped out in that sense that I could go um, and I had meetings with like program directors at other schools that were my top choices as well so I think it's not about who you know it's about who knows you so it's like you want to get your name out there you want to meet people and kind of network and I think not going to a school that has a program there, it does make it harder because you do have to put in a bit more effort because it's not like you can just do your neurosurgery rotation and 
they get to know you. So, so yeah, that's kind of my main tip there. Does that answer your question or help a, a little bit? Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hi, everyone. Um, I had a question that uh, kind of builds up on just the points we were talking about. Um, in terms of doing like away electives, now that they are allowed, um, if you could go back, how early would you start uh, that process? Would you keep it for your fourth year or maybe even start in, in third year? I can, I can talk about that, Ali. So I think I, I briefly mentioned in my previous question that it's important to, ha to have, I think, exposure to neurosurgery in the third year because you just want to confirm that this is what you like to do for the rest of your life as early as possible. I mean, of course, I know that some people, they, 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 they change their mind to apply for neurosurgery almost in, the, uh, in between after the fourth year, I mean, in the after fourth year, and it was successful. But I mean, the earlier you decide, you, you just um, make your mind so that make it easier for you to plan ahead and then make connections as to work on the application process. So I, I recommend to have the first exposure to neurosurgery in the third year to just confirm this is what you like to do for the rest of your life. And then, um, uh, for example, if, if, you, uh, if you have a top school in your mind, uh, in, you know, um, at the beginning of the fourth year, I recommend to have that as school as a last elective of neurosurgery. Such that you have experience in the other schools, you 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 have you have some uh, basic knowledge about neurosurgery pathologies, and then when you when you just do your elective in in the, in the top of school, so you're much much more prepared, and then there's a higher chance that you, you basically get a good recommendation letter from them, and um, basically uh, they, they like your performance. Um, I also agree with I also just have something to say about that. As far as, um, I don't know how other schools work for clerkship. I don't know if everybody has the same setup for clerkship, but I know that for us for third year, we were just jam packed with, um, I think we had like two weeks of holidays in the summer and two at Christmas. So there was really no time to do any kind of external electives or anything. But like Andrea said, like reaching out early, I think is very reasonable to do if you're going to plan to do electives, trying to build that correspondence over email or Zoom or whatever the case may be just to facilitate the fact that they'll know your face and know your name so that when you do ask for an elective or request one, however that process works, again, we're not familiar with it because we didn't get to do it. Um, you have a little bit of an, an easier time going forward with that. And um, I had another point, but now it's gone. But that's it. <laughs> I think, uh, I think your elective planning will also uh, depend on uh, this upcoming year's application deadlines. Um, I don't know if they're sticking with like the January deadline or moving it up to November or something. So that will determine when you do electives, depending on if you want reference letters uh, with your application from your electives or like uh, visiting electives. So it depends kind of what reference letters you want and then kind of work backwards from the deadline. Also, uh, depending on how many people are interested in neurosurgery this year, uh, the electives could, especially the visiting electives could be competitive. So there's no you know, guarantee of you know, your exact dates that you want. So you have to kind of roll with those punches as they come. Super, thank you so much. Hey guys. Anything? Oh, sorry, sorry, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, I'll ask after. I was just going to say, um, in addition to that, Ali, um, for any of you who are in second year or even first year who are thinking about clerkship and the way that your track selection is going to go again, I don't know how it works for everybody. But for us, we had, you know, um, you would do your surgery section, your internal medicine, and emergency section, et cetera. And if you're really interested in surgery and you think that that's what you want to do, take that into consideration when you're doing your track selection as well. Look to put surgery maybe after internal medicine so you have the ability to cope with working on a ward and manage basic problems on the ward and things like that to set yourself up with as much knowledge as possible so that you're as helpful to the residents, you're showing the knowledge that you have, you're setting yourself up for success a little bit more in that way. It doesn't always work out that way because in our school it's a lottery, but um, that's something that I would consider early on too for those of you in Med 1 to going into clerkship.
Um, I had a quick question. Um, thanks for everyone for uh, for joining today and answering our questions. Um, how did you guys ask for or go about asking for references during your um, third year? Would would you like mention it at the start of your elective or how did you go about doing that? So I think I can start. I think we had a bit of a different kind of system because we didn't have visiting electives. I knew I had eight weeks to ask. Um, so I was like, you know, I think we had we were we were lucky in that sense. I think the fact that you're doing a fourth year elective, they already kind of know that this is what you want to do. Um, I don't think people do neurosurgery electives for fun. So if you're there, they know that you're probably gonna ask for a letter down the road. Um, so I would wait till like towards the end of when your elective is gonna be done. Um, I would ask the residents kind of like what they think. Also, uh, residents have a lot of good information. They'll tell you like, oh, Dr. So-and-so writes good letters. Um, he's usually very helpful. Um, and once they know that you are interested in a letter and that you're gonna ask, they can put in a good word. I think that happened a lot for me that the residents would, would speak to the staff maybe behind closed doors and say, you know, Chris might ask you for a letter. I've worked with him, he's, he's good or whatnot. So I think that's one way. Um, I would always say try to ask in person as much as possible. Like an email obviously works, but ask in person. And then I would send the follow-up email a day or two later just saying, thanks for offering to do a letter. Uh, here's my CV if you want. Here's how many electives I did. Here's the things I did with you. And on elective, I kept track of what I did. Um, yeah, and I think clinic's also a great place to ask because in the OR, they don't got time for you. Um, they're busy. So if you get to go to their clinic one day, you see patients with them, you review with them, and at the end of the clinic, you can say, hey, would you be comfortable writing me a letter? I would echo what Chris said. I feel like we're, it's definitely different than doing traveling electives because you do have that mindset of eight weeks that you can talk to the residents, identify who's good to get the letter with. And I would almost try to cherry pick those ORs and go to those clinic days for the people who I wanted letters from. So they kind of eventually knew that, oh yeah, you're here for neurosurgery. So it's kind of an expectation that they would write you a letter. So traveling electives, it's, it's not gonna be like that because you have such a short period of time. Um, so it, it does change things, but I think it's important to let them know that you're interested in neurosurgery and, and try to work with that person who you want the letter from as much as you can and always talk to the residents because they, they know who writes a good letter and who, who not to ask. So I echo everything Chris said. I just want to add something small here that um, I think I, I, I would say that it's better to ask recommendation letter for from everyone you can. It's okay to have like a more than three recommendation letter when you want to apply. And then you can choose which one you want to send over because maybe uh, yeah, you have a best neurosurgeon who is very well known for the great recommendation letters. He agrees to, or he or she agrees to write down a letter. And then I don't know, it's like one day before the submission and then they haven't received a letter yet. So then if you have the backup option, that also like it um, helps you to ele elevate the stress. So I recommend to just ask from everyone if you feel that, for example, that the person is is um, is actually uh, likes your performance, will ask for the recommendation letter, and you can decide. And the other thing is, just want to echo what Chris mentioned that is is important to ask in person and ask with a strong recommendation letter because from the way they respond you in person, you can understand whether they just they are forced to something write write something for you or they're really. Uh, expired, you know, inspired by the, by the way you just perform your in your collection, then you can you have a better understanding of how good is uh, that that uh, letter would be. I also just want to add on top of what Mohammed said about asking for a strong or a favorable reference letter is very important. They don't know if you don't use the reference letter, so they don't get any kind of notification or anything like that saying that their reference letter was unused. So ask for as many as you feel will be sufficient and have a variety. I submitted different letters to different schools because I knew that certain neurosurgeons are gonna highlight certain technical aspects that I could perform or research aspects that I could perform. And I kind of cherry picked which letters I was going to submit to each school to ensure that they got the best picture of me for what their needs were in a resident. So they won't know if you don't use them or you don't use all of them. You might not even use one of them at all. They will never know. Great, thank you. Uh, I was just gonna quickly add as well. Um, where where I did med school, um, 
we have four different sites for neurosurgery. And so um, it's, it's kind of like doing visit electives where I spend like two weeks at each site. <coughs> kind of felt, I, I certainly felt that rush to need to ask for a letter before I move on to the new hospital. I would say how I went about it, I'm sure people kind of did it in different ways too. Uh, but I think by the end of, if it's like a two week elective by the end of the first week, you can just reach out to your supervisor quickly, uh, just send them a quick email, give them a heads up like next week or last week to see if they have any availabilities to briefly meet with you. Uh, you know, travel feedback, try to ask for, and then if they're available to meet with you, use the opportunity to lend, just, you know, ask for any advice they have, ask for a letter, things like that. So. Thank you. So I had a question also. So you guys, most of you, you said um, you didn't have away electives. And I think away electives are uh, a good way to meet people at different institutions. So you guys obviously. So I didn't have that opportunity. So I just wanted to know, how did you go about, um, you know, making connections with people and, and uh, you know, meeting them? Just so you know, like which institution fits better with what you want and all of that. So ahead of uh, the interviews and even before the CARMS applications, um, well, uh, Cam Sun put on a great event um, that brought together, I think it was 10 program directors from um, most of the programs. And so that was an opportunity for us to learn about the programs. Um, after that, most programs also did an open house, kind of anywhere from like October throughout January. And uh, there again, it was a program director and a couple of residents. And so that uh, offered a chance to learn about the programs. And then during the actual CARMS tour, um, because ours were virtual and uh, probably for future years as well, all the um, socials were also uh, virtual. And that was an opportunity a lot of the time for question and answers and learning more about the program as well. And so that helped. I guess, uh, determine, you know, where you may be a good fit and uh, opportunity to ask the residents questions as well, both about the program, but also, you know, life outside of the program. Just a small comment to what Irene said. We will also be having the third uh, CARMS uh, program director session for this year as well, for those of you interested, we're in the works of uh, planning it. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll do a follow-up on a question that I'm interested in uh, regarding work management and uh, sort of the anatomy of a daily schedule. Uh, what sort of things uh, would you say are key for uh, earlier on learners, people in med one, med two, to sort of focus on reading of labs, sort of calling in imaging, like what sort of skill sets would you see within that domain is important if you were to categorize it? So I can say something. Um, so I think for consults, firstly, I think the most important thing is knowing, is this serious or is it not serious? Um, most of the times the residents will triage it for you. So they won't give you anything that's like super crazy. But let's say they're in an OR and they're maybe holding the page or whatever. You need to be able to determine is this serious or not. So I think just knowing kind of what crazy bleed is or if someone's got a really bad spine fracture or whatnot, I think being able to determine that's the most important thing. In terms of the floor, honestly, like someone mentioned, most of the times it's kind of the run-of-the-mill floor stuff that you would get on any any service. So getting the basic things down um, goes a long way. And then, and then, yeah, that's that's kind of what I, my two cents about it would be. Just to add to to those skills, which I I think are really important. Um, I think it's also important to just. We kind of talked about this before, but as a first and second year med, med student, obviously you still have a lot to learn like <laughs> about working in the hospital. But I think being able to familiarize yourself with like what a progress note entails, like what that makes up. And then you could always ask a resident, hey, can I write a progress note for you? So whether that's in the computer system or handwritten notes, depending on what hospital you're at. 
sometimes they'll let you do that. And as a first year, second year, being able to help with notes, the residents will love you for that. Cause they're like, Hey, I don't have to do the note. And if you're trustworthy and make a good note, they'll end up letting you do more things because you're showing that you're helpful and that you're interested. So that obviously applies to like consult notes when you get to that point, as well as just like OR notes. So I think knowing those skills and, and offering them, people appreciate. I have another question if that's all right. Yeah, um, so one of the residents I spoke to previously at my own program at uh, Western said that a key thing that helped him get into residency was that he was able to sell himself to the program as in what made him unique compared to the other applicants. And I was wondering if anyone on the panel had any tips or uh, any uh, comment on that. That's probably I the hardest that, part about CARMS. Sorry, no, I was just going to say, knowing what makes you unique and getting asked that question is very hard. I still don't know, but, but yeah, go Just ahead. to echo, I was going to say the same thing as Chris, being that when you're in a group of people who are such hard, like so hardworking, who have such interest in research and academic excellence, it's so hard to make yourself stand out. But just being yourself in the interviews, genuinely conveying your genuine interests outside of neurosurgery, I think is something that tends to make you more unique because we all have good reference letters. We all have some sort of research in the field. We all are able to explain how to put in an EVD when they ask us. But those questions that they're asking you that are obscure, what are your hobbies? Those are kind of the ways that I found I made myself stand out more because like I said, everybody on paper is very, very knowledgeable and looks very, very good. So I think that the personal touch to it can make you very unique. And I think just to echo on what Jennifer was saying, I think by just genuinely expressing your interest and being true to yourself, I think that also helps find a school that's a good fit for you because you don't want to like fake it and develop this story that may not be so true. Um, and then you end up going to a school that seems like a good fit on paper, but may not be in actuality. So I, I think, yeah, everyone is super smart. It's super competitive, but I think if you're just genuinely excited, it will come out and come through in the interview. And I think that's a way to just be able to match to a school that, that fits you too. So one of the questions is how are you transitioning in terms of your time and how you're dedicating it until July 1st? What are you, what's on the works for you besides all the neurosurgery questions? I went to Italy for two weeks and then I'm doing nothing. I'm writing step two, I guess, at the end of in a week just to have that done. But uh, no, I've just been traveling. I went to Vegas and I went to New York then I went to Italy. I'm just taking all my time off, enjoying it before before July 1st when I'm probably on call and and going to need my sleep. Yeah, I'd echo that. Also, I uh, did some traveling down to the Caribbean on back-to-back -back cruises and then some cottage weekends as well with friends. Uh, I think especially for um, uh, a lot of us uh, who are, I guess, uh, going to a different city, we'll be, you know, moving, packing up. That takes a lot of time too. And then uh, for myself, uh, finish up you know, a lot of research work as well. So that's uh, ongoing. And then, um, yeah, like... Um, was previously mentioned as well. I also wrote the step two and uh, the Canadian uh, med exam. And that was uh, essentially all of April after uh, CARM's match. You can go next. Mine was not as, uh, as interesting as Jennifer's and, and Irene's much more boring. So I was just staying in Vancouver, packing my stuff and um, sending over my furniture to Ottawa. It's a big move from Vancouver to Ottawa. And uh, yeah, working on the same time on the, on the research projects, uh, ongoing research projects. And uh, yeah, I'm going to Ottawa this Tuesday. I'm very really excited to meet the new team there and also uh, meet the new city. I had never been in Ottawa before, so that's a good surprise for me. <laughs>
Yeah, I echo what everyone's been saying. I took some time to move, um, which is always a lot of effort. I uh, wrote the step one, step two in the Canadian board exam. So that was fun. <laughs> um, and then just doing some traveling. As I said, I'm in Norway right now. So just trying to enjoy life before it gets crazy again and sleeping a lot. I've been doing that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, maybe another question, as people might be interested in, is what sort of things besides neurosurgery did you do in your electives in your fourth year? So I think this will be uh, relevant for everyone because uh, they have the eight-week cap, so you can really only do eight weeks of neurosurgery. And so um, you're actually forced to fill the rest of the time with uh, non-neurosurgical stuff. So uh, for myself, it was uh, already quite interested in neurosurgery from the start. I uh, looked for complementary um, uh, electives for neurosurgery. So I did uh, like neurointerventional radiology that fell under diagnostic radiology. Um, I also did neur neurology. Um, what else? I did uh, ortho trauma spine at Sunnybrook. So uh, that was very good focus on spine, which obviously has a huge overlap with neurosurgery. And, and I also did um, uh, trauma neuro ICU at St. Mike's. And so um, we're specifically taking care of just neurosurgical patients there. So I uh, thought it was a great compliment to neurosurgery and gave me uh, a lot of um information and obviously uh info on especially ward management especially the uh, critical care of the uh, uh neuro icu part i did something similar as well um i did things that would complement neurosurgery but also things that i would enjoy or i didn't get to see in my core rotation um, I did ICU, a stroke neurology, vascular surgery. Um, and then my school offered like a research uh, block. So I did research. It was like a neurosurgery project. Um, um, and then I did a family medicine electives. I thought that applied to everything. And uh, at the end, I did an ophthalmology one just because I didn't get to see it in third year. And I thought it'd be a good way to taper down the year. Uh, Mine was overall similar in the sense that I did eight weeks of neurosurgery. I did three weeks of adult neurology, three weeks of surgical ICU. So managing about 50% of our ICU, surgical ICU here at um, Health Sciences Center in Manitoba is neurosurgical patients, as well as other trauma patients. And I knew it was a rotation that um, you do in your first year of residency here for the neurosurgical resi uh, residency program. So I decided it would be a good idea, as well as two weeks of pediatric neurology. I found that um, one of the things that lacked in my training, for sure, especially in, even in neurosurgery doing eight weeks of it, was examining children and babies specifically. Getting a meaningful neurological exam in an infant is very difficult, so I decided to commit myself to doing two weeks of pediatric neurology to try to determine how to figure uh, what's wrong with a child that has no way of communicating with you. So it was very beneficial. And then post CARMS, I did no clinical care. I did a three week cadaver preparation lab and then um, anatomical radiology. So I haven't been in the hospital in, in a, a minute. <laughs> yeah, mine were very, Go ahead, oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. mine were very similar to everyone else's. I did like the max four blocks in neurosurgery. I did um, radiology, ICU. I also did ENT and gen surge just to be in the OR. And then post CARMS, I did a anatomy block just to get that cadaver work in. So very, very similar. I yeah, just wanted to say that mine is very similar as well. Eight weeks of neurosurgery. I think getting a spine in orthopedic is, is a one way that can have more than eight weeks of neurosurgery exposure because in a spine trauma, you just basically do this uh, neurosurgery operations in a spine that you can, you can max it to 10 weeks of neurosurgery exposure. And then I had two weeks of vascular surgery because at UBC, basically at VGH, we have an endotrectomy done by the vascular surgery team. This is something which is done by the neurosurgeon and other uh, hospitals. So that's a good exposure for that. And 
neuroradiology as well. I think it's very important to have neuroradiology. If you can have it before the neurosurgery electives, it's very beneficial because you learn how to read uh, uh, CT scan and, and MRIs. That's very, very uh, important skill you can, you can develop. And also I had um, four weeks of emergency post carms because we have to get um, four weeks of like a general uh, elective, like some, either CTU or emergency. So I just chose emergency to hopefully see more patients <laughs> with the neurosurgical pathologies. Yeah, um, I also chose to do complementary elective, so I had nothing much too too much to add from that. Um, I think I'd be curious to hear though, if, to to see if anyone from our group that matched this year and a parallel planning. But I think that's a question you have to ask yourself. There's a different specialty. Uh, you also enjoy as much, maybe a little bit less, but uh, can also see yourself very much enjoying what to apply to. Then that's a big decision you have to make uh, as to how to split your electives between two possibly three different specialties. Uh, I didn't opt to do it because um, like some of the other people here, I was pretty late switch too. So I want to focus like my chances in neurosurgery first before thinking about something else. But if you're someone who, you know, who is confident in your, your, your application in neurosurgery and is, there's also a specialty that you can very much see yourself enjoying in. And I see that's uh, as a reasonable option too, but that's a question you have to ask yourself. I forgot to mention something that you know. It's uh, I think it's very important to have an ICU experience, you know, uh, in the fourth year, because for, for, uh, you know, as my personal experience in the third year, the first time I went to ICU to see patients, I was uh, really scared by all the tubes and all the devices around the patient. And when you have like a, even two weeks of ICU rotation, so you gradually learn what's the what's the purpose of each of those devices, what's the purpose of each of those tubes. And that make it like a much less scary when you want to start your elective, you know, your residency in the first year. So then you're familiar with, with some of the things they do in, in the ICU. I think that helps a lot. I strongly recommend to have an ICU rotation. Thank you, everyone. It's very informative. I guess we'll ask a few more questions and then uh, maybe we won't do the breakout rooms because it seems like uh, people are getting the questions answered. The other thing I think, and I'm trying to ask questions that are applicable to everyone, is the timeline of your CARMS application and when did you start writing your essays, the references I think we went over, uh, the entries, and what advice would you give uh, uh, to reduce the stress? Again, I think it depends on the timelines. Uh, for us, I think we're fortunate that they were due January 10th, so after the Christmas holidays. Uh, I don't know about the others on here if they worked in advance, but I essentially dedicated my entire Christmas break. We had three weeks for CARMS applications. Uh, I tried as much as possible to do all the um, uh, like fill in, you know, your CV and all your extracurricular activities, which is just kind of like, um, yeah, just filling in the application. Uh, you think that's easy, but it actually takes a lot of time. So I tried to do that. Um, uh, that didn't require as much mental power as opposed to actually writing the essays. Uh, but obviously, you know, uh, people will tell you start sooner rather than later. I don't know how much of that uh, we actually did, to be honest, I didn't uh, start that early. But um, yeah, it's always best to uh, get as much done as possible because also, uh, especially for the essays, you would like other people to read it and um, it's difficult to get that done if you're doing it last minute or you know, over the Christmas holidays when people are away or vacationing, that's the last thing they wanna do is uh, be reading Carm's letters, so. Thank you. Oh, Chris, I think you were going to say something. I was just going to say, try to get it started as soon as possible. When you're in fourth year, you're doing your electives and you're doing call and you're coming home tired. You're not going to want to work on your personal statements. Just try to get started as early as possible. Um, yeah, that's that's really it. Like, I wouldn't leave it to the last minute, but some people work you know, under pressure and they do great work. But if you're not one of those people, I would start as soon as possible. And just to add on to that too, um, I think 
you, we kind of touched on this earlier, but I think if you know, you want to do neurosurgery, like I knew in second year. So any exposure I had, whether that was an observership, a selective, like I would write these stories down. Doesn't mean I use them in my personal statement, but it just helps you like brainstorm. And then by the time you do clerkship and your electives, you're like, you have your stories down and it makes it like a lot easier to write something because you, you've thought about it for a long time, or at least that's what worked for me. So I definitely tried to start as early as, as I could and tried to get it done before my fourth year electives were finished and before I went on neurosurgery in fourth year, because I knew I would be way too tired to think straight to write a, a decent letter. So that's what worked for me. I think also to uh, add on what Andrea was saying is that uh, what I found was uh, super helpful is that uh, I always had an up-to-date CV. And so that's a major component of the application as well. And that CV also is what you fill in on the application. And so, you know, every time, you know, you do a research project or publish your paper, get an award or do some extracurricular involvement or volunteer at, you know, this poster competition, whatever it may be. Um, just put it on your CV and then uh, you'll have all the information there. So I know a lot of my colleagues spent a lot of time like updating their CV, figuring out like what they had done in the last uh, five or plus years. And so uh, just keeping it up to date, I think is uh, crucial because you'll need that CV obviously for the applications, but also when you're sending it to reference letters or to references. And so it's uh, great to have it up to date and in a ready to go format. All of your medical schools should have application review kind of services offered to you. Um, and I find that my deadline is very much driven by those services. Like, oh, I got to book a CV review appointment here. So I uh, try to force myself to finish the CV by land and then same thing for my personal statements. Uh, but again, um, like everyone is saying, sooner rather than later, sometimes it's easier said than done, but just try your best. Thank you, everyone. Any other last minute questions anyone else has in the group? Uh, I had a question about uh, USMLE exams. A lot of you, uh, you've done it. So just wanted to know, because some people tell me it's better to do it post-match, step one, two. Some people say just do step one right like before your clerkship. So just wanted to know your take on it. From my understanding, um, my school, uh, University of Manitoba writes NBMEs. So we write the American exams throughout our clerkship. Our school doesn't make our exams. So for us, it makes more sense to write it as soon as possible after clerkship is done or because you've just written these exams, you've just studied UWorld, you've just been familiarized with how these exams work. So that's why I'm writing mine I step two now, but I haven't written step one. You don't have to write them in order either. Step one, from my understanding, is a lot more basic science knowledge. And I think that's going to take me some dedicated textbook studying, not just doing, you know, a few year old questions a day to refresh my memory on obstetrics and gynecology. So I personally would say if you have time to write step one earlier, write it earlier. But um, depending on what your school uses for your third year examinations, I think it depends on on each person if you want to write it in fourth year before CARMS, if you want to write it after CARMS, but even getting it over with before residency probably makes the most sense to me personally, just because I know I'll be busy and tired. I think at a minimum, uh, if you want to write the steps, you can uh, write step two and your uh, Canadian exam at the same time. I essentially studied for both using the U world and wrote them kind of within three days of each other. And um, yeah, personally, I haven't yet written step one. So uh, like Jennifer was saying, you don't need to do them in order either. And so, um, yeah. All right, thank you everyone again for coming and answering all the questions. I know summer is a good time to relax before July 1st, so we sincerely appreciate your participation. And uh, some of you have already agreed that if there's any questions that other members have, we can either connect them or if you don't mind writing, putting them under email, no pressure, of course. 
uh, people can reach out to you and uh, really great to have all of you and best wishes for your future career in neurosurgery.